It's the one place in Las Vegas where there's no business like the art of show business. The tale of the railroad is still being told, and every living and growing thing plays its own starring role. Here at the Springs Preserve, where all that matters is what's elemental. The title of the current exhibit at the Nevada State Museum is as phenomenal as its subject, Les Folies Brugere, entertaining Las Vegas one rhinestone at a time. And the artistry, beauty, and historic importance of the Tropicana's long-running Parisian cabaret are represented by a wide selection of costumes, photographs, and personal accounts from this fondly remembered age of spectacular showman and showgirl ship. Folie Bergère landed here in 1959 on Christmas Eve. It came here directly from Paris. The show was built and designed in Paris and then shipped over here uh, for use on our stage at the Tropicana Hotel and Casino. And the show lasted for almost 50 years, finally closing in 2009. The secret to its longevity may have been its endless inventiveness. The show would change out its sets and costumes every few years so you could see a brand new version or edition of the Folie Bergère show in Las Vegas every other year. At its height it was a one-of-a-kind show in this country. Short of going to Paris to see a show like this, a cabaret show, Las Vegas was it. Vegas was the closest you could get to Paris especially because the shows actually were designed in the early years by French people the same designers that were building and designing for the Paris stage were designing and building for our stage here. The revolutionary French design aesthetic is undeniably present in the extensive and iconic costumes that are on display from the museum's collection. Because we have in this collection at the Nevada State Museum a 50-year span of costumes, you really can see an evolution of stage costume from the 60s through the early 2000s. So each era has its own sort of unique statement and unique style. But the costumes are best brought to life by the memories of the performers who wore them. Because the show just closed in 2009, there's still a lot of men and women that are working and living here in Vegas that can come and tell me their stories. Um, this exhibit includes audio, visual, oral histories from these people. It's fun to have a narrative behind the costume and know who wore them and when and what were some of the fun things or negative things or interesting things that happened to these people while they were wearing the costumes. That really does add a lot of life to the actual physical garment. Their stories also add a lot to our knowledge of the backstage drama involved in appearing graceful while parading around in these wearable but weighty works of art. There's a big headdress. It's, it's a headdress attached to a wig. And there's this sort of abstract bird shape sticking straight up from the top. It's a wire frame totally covered in rhinestones, which are glass and heavy. And it probably weighs 30 plus pounds and she remembers she tells this great story about trying to figure out how to carry the headdress so she didn't look like her, there was any weight to it because that's the trick of being a showgirl right is making these 30 pound headdresses look effortless and being able to still float across the stage so she tells a great story about how she totally did not succeed in the task and she was fired for a second until someone then said, no, you're not really fired, but you got to figure out how to carry that headdress. So there's nothing easy about being a showgirl. <laughs> the men had an easier time playing their own roles as elegantly tailored but understated set pieces. The men were very elegant and they were just there to sort of point at the women and to remind everyone that's who they should be looking at. There are a few examples um, over the years where the men got to wear character costumes, and those are costumes that are of a particular period or theme, but mostly it was tails and tuxedos with a few rhinestones on the lapels or on a waistcoat vest. The spirit of this time and place is also portrayed in exceptional detail through the period photographs that complete the exhibit. 
The other really fantastic thing about this exhibit, not only are there costumes on display, but there are photographs, archival photographs from the Las Vegas News Bureau's archive. And most of these photographs have never been seen before. And they're photographs from the very first day of the show to the very last day of the show. They're fitting tributes to so many showbiz visionaries who became citizens of Las Vegas and contributed so much to the city's culture. I think of them as our sort of settlers, our early settlers. A lot of these men and women actually moved to Las Vegas to work in these shows. And they stayed here and they raised families and so they're an important part of our history. Come experience the advanced technologies of tomorrow today in our new traveling exhibit, Science Fiction, Science Future, on display in the Origin Museum through January 8th. For more information, visit springspreserve.org. The butterfly's image of fluttery delicacy is actually quite contrary to the species' sheer variety of distinctive types that can endure the most trying transformations and travels across extreme terrains, including surviving in their Mojave home and thriving in the habitat we've created for some truly exotic specimens here at the Springs Preserve. several species that live here in southern Nevada so we'll commonly see monarchs that fly through on their migration path. We've got queens that we have that live here. We've got cabbage whites. We've got some swallowtails that live here. More than their striking beauty, people admire and study the wondrous natural process of metamorphosis that so completely changes them throughout their lifetime. So they start out as an egg, that hatches, they become a caterpillar, until they finally reach a stage where they go into what we call a pupa or a chrysalis. Um, that's their pupal stage. That, inside that chrysalis is when the caterpillar metamorphoses into a butterfly. It's no wonder then that they're so very hungry in every form they take and endlessly inventive in their feeding habits. So once they eclose on our, a butterfly, they subsist on nectar. So um, they have a very long tongue, basically, that uncurls, their little proboscis, and it uncurls, and it will go right down into the flower, and they'll drink the nectar right from within the flower. And the really kind of fun thing about that is that they don't taste with that, they actually taste with their feet. So all of their taste sensors is, are on their feet, and that's where they, um, they'll kind of land on a flower, check it out, see if it, it maybe is a tasty flower, and then they'll start to drink the nectar. In this eat or be eaten world, they've also developed some clever devices to confuse potential predators. So we have a few that mimic one another. Uh, the, ca the queen caterpillars mimic the monarch caterpillars. The reason for that is that monarchs are poisonous. So it's, it pays off to look like them. They get eaten less often. But other caterpillars look different from one another too. And you can actually identify the species of butterfly based on the caterpillar. And you'll get plenty of practice identifying all kinds of different caterpillars and butterflies at almost every time of the year throughout the preserve. There are lots of plants that the butterflies like here. One of the ones that is just immensely popular with butterflies and hummingbirds are lantana. Lantana is crazy popular. I've also seen some other flowering plants like um, sages that are very popular and I think that the bluebells are popular as well. Those are all plants that you can get um, at some of the local nurseries even or even at our plant sale. And once you draw butterflies into your yard with these popular plants, you can expect to see them fluttering about for a significant part of the year. We see them starting in the spring all the way through fall. So really the only time we don't have butterflies active here is through the winter time when it gets colder at night. Um, but some of our hardier species, and especially those monarchs that do that great migration, they'll fly through here regularly throughout the year. And many glamorous butterflies that aren't natives or frequent visitors are well represented and easy to see in our seasonal habitat. We would love to have you come visit us in the butterfly habitat. We've got things like blue morphos, which are those gigantic silvery blue butterflies that come from Central America. We usually have swallowtails and various kinds of monarchs, some peacock butterflies. We end up with lots of little buckeyes, which are the little uh, brown and orange guys that flitter all over the place. Lots of fancy and really beautiful colored butterflies for you guys to come and see. 
Our hugely popular butterfly habitat will be open for most of the fall until the cooler weather comes. But you can follow all our flight plans up until the end of the season by visiting our website at springspreserve.org or follow us on social media to be the first to know. Las Vegas has hardly ever been considered middle of the road, except when it came to the fortunate geography that placed the town midway between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles. And it was even luckier to be located in a valley that overflowed with a wealth of spring water, because these features combined to set so many people and wheels of progress in motion. And visitors to the Origin Museum's Railroad History Exhibit can relive the actual land auction that made this improbable story possible. Well, Las Vegas was sort of the main division point, the halfway point between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles. And so because of its location and because of the, the abundance of water that came out of the Las Vegas Springs, out of the Big Springs, uh, it was an important source of water for locomotives, for trains. So it's no surprise that a mining magnate would recognize how valuable these resources could be for his own grand railroad scheme. William Andrews Clark, who was a late 19th century copper baron, robber baron, wanted to set up his own railroad to take his uh, ores that he was coming, uh, bringing out of Montana from his copper mines. And so he developed the railroad between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles and the, and the port of San Pedro in, in, in Los Angeles as a means to get that ore to the coast. But there were many powerful men who had their eyes on the prize of this particular right of way that ran straight through Las Vegas. There was some competition at the time because the Union Pacific was being built at the same time and E.A. Harriman, who was the, the head of the Union Pacific at the time, didn't want a competing railroad and uh, William Andrews Clark uh, had enough money he could buy up whatever he wanted for the most part. Even owning half of a railroad would make both rich men that much richer. In the end, uh, the Union Pacific and Clark came to an agreement where E.H. Harriman, who, who ran the Union Pacific, owned a 50% stock in the San Pedro, Los Angeles and Salt Lake Railroad and uh, the SP, LA and SL could use uh, the Union Pacific tracks to move their trains from Salt Lake City down, uh, down to Los Angeles. But there was still an element of risk and some major investments to be made in creating a company town almost from the ground up. Las Vegas was small, it was dusty, it was hot, uh, there were no amenities, there was no real infrastructure, so it wasn't necessarily a place where you were going to bring your family and set up shop, you know, immediately. The railroad men knew that people would follow the work and water. And if you were going to build shops, if you're going to build machine shops to, to help repair trains, you need a workforce. And at the time, uh, in the early 1900s, 1902, there were probably no more than 20 or 30 people that lived in Las Vegas. And so they needed to develop uh, Las Vegas as a town to help support these machine shops. So in about 1902, uh, Clark and his uh, backers purchased 1,800 acres from Helen Stewart. Uh, that included the Las Vegas Springs uh, and Helen Stewart's ranch, and also purchased the water rights uh, for the water coming out of the springs. Then, in the first of the great Las Vegas promotional campaigns, they described a desert that was just waiting to bloom and a supply of water that was endless in the imagination. When we go back and look at historic newspapers, we can see advertisements both in the Salt Lake newspapers and the Los Angeles new newspapers uh, highlighting how uh, wonderful the climate was in Las Vegas, how there was, there was flowing water, how there was vegetation, how it was, uh, it was a perfect community to come out for farming, but also touting the development of the shops and the development of the railroad and access to, to Salt Lake City and Los Angeles from Las Vegas. The robber barons made out like bandits by betting on the competitive advantages of buyers trying to outbid each other in an auction sale. So over 3,000 people came out on that, uh, on that May Day uh, here in Las Vegas to bid on town sites, to bid on plots. And uh, for the most part, um, people felt like they were getting a square deal. Uh, a plot of land you could get for 150, 170, uh, corner lots, upwards $300, $500, but the prices went up uh, pretty quickly. And at the end of the two-day auction, they made over $270,000. And once again, if we translate that in today's money, uh, that's over $6 million they made just from land auctions from the Clark Las Vegas town site. Even today, guests can get caught up in all the expectations and excitement of the auction atmosphere. When visitors uh, walk amongst the statues, they trigger an audio 
uh, file or an audio discussion basically that happens overhead amongst many of the folks that you see represented behind me talking about the auction itself, whether or not they want to live in Las Vegas, maybe it does or doesn't have the services that they're used to, uh, maybe they consider it a good deal or a bad deal based on the, the size of the parcel. Over a century later, both the optimism and practical considerations of betting on Las Vegas still reinforce the challenges of living in a company town. Las Vegas in many ways has been a boom town. If you look at the ebb and flow of the economy nationally, uh, Las Vegas fits very, very well into that. But Las Vegas can consider itself fortunate in conserving one of the essential resources that has always kept the city going in forward motion toward its future. One of the reasons that Las Vegas has done well is it has a natural resource that a lot of these smaller communities lack, uh, and that would be water. And in fact, it was water that lured the, the animals and the plants here, and then the Native Americans and the early pioneers, but more importantly, it was water that lured the railroad here. At the Big Springs Gallery through January 8th, the Preserve is welcoming the members of the American Society of Railway Artists in their annual juried show of paintings portraying the nostalgia of the Iron Horse and its modern importance to North America. For more information, visit our website at springspreserve.org. A well-chosen souvenir should provide pleasant reminders of a special trip. And the selection of natural, recycled, and unique holiday presents at the Springs Preserve gift shop will make the memories of your trip last and share them with your friends and loved ones. The Springs Preserve gift shop is a great place to pick up a memento of your visit. So much of what you'll find here in the gift shop relates back to um, our mission here at the Springs Preserve. You'll find um, books that will teach you how to live in harmony with the desert. You'll find beautiful jewelry, most of it one-of-a-kind pieces, that's actually made from, um, from items that, that come out of the desert. We are featuring a new artist, a uh, local artist who is actually utilizing turquoise that was mined here locally. We're trying to highlight uh, these types of artists and we're planning events in the future that will give you an opportunity to come and meet the artist and talk to them about why the desert is important to them and what is important to them about utilizing materials that come from where we live. Uh, it's also a great place to drop in if you're planning to walk down to the gardens or go out onto the trails. You can pick up a hat or a bottle of water or any kind of sundries that you might need for your visit at the preserve. It's also a really fun place to come and check out the items that we have that relate to our seasonal events. Um, as we move into fall and Haunted Harvest is coming up and uh, Dia de Muertos, Day of the Dead, we will have some fantastic items in the gift shop that people can come in and get to take with them into the celebration that will help them to celebrate. And they can also get some items that they can take home and decorate their own homes for the holidays. The Springs Preserve gift shop is more than just a place to buy things. It is a place where you can have an interactive experience. We have our mining camp experience where kids can come in and they, they purchase a bag of minerals and then they get to go through the process of actually um, mining, pan mining those minerals. And we also have a really fun uh, lightsaber building activity where kids can come in, they get to choose what kind of handle they want, and they get to decorate their own lightsaber. And buying something at Springs Preserve is a great benefit of membership. Every member gets 10% off uh, their total purchase, so you'll find amazing, beautiful, one-of-a-kind things here, and you'll also get a special, special discount because you are a part of the Springs Preserve family as a member. It's been said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and the true proof of this wise saying is the inspiration for our new fall show, Copycats and Other Critters, which demonstrates how proud inventors are mimicking the highly intelligent designs of the animal world to create the innovations of tomorrow. We've really tried to adjust the fall shows uh, to complement and to kind of uh, go along with the exhibits. The exhibit during the fall is science fiction, science future, and it's all about how the inspiration for technology kind of affects the directions it's going. 
we realize that a lot of the inspiration for technology and technological advancements come from the natural world. You know, like you can talk about Velcro sneakers were developed because the guy that discovered it uh, was curious about birds sticking in his dog's fur after they went for hikes. And it's uh, going to be a show that kind of shows and highlights how some of these inventions and interventions and things coming in the future are inspired by the nature all around us. The show features a fascinating cast of Mojave animals from our living collection, including spiders that provide a model for futuristic technology, which will give mobility to people who find movement a challenge. The same natural systems that help tarantulas move around are going to eventually be developed to help people who haven't been able to walk, you know, walk for the first time. And uh, hydraulic exoskeletons that will uh, affect us, you know, we'll use every day in the coming years. And the scientists who so seriously studied the very slither of the snake have successfully copied it as an ingenious rescue mechanism. One of the things we were really fascinated by was the ability for Mojave Desert animals uh, to act in ways that humans can't. So for example, looking at a snake being able to slither through a rock pile inspired emergency personnel to develop robots and robotic uh, you know, equipment that could search through fallen buildings after earthquakes and discover survivors and really help make real positive change you know, as far as you know, inspiring technology. But we believe our audiences will also find a lot to learn in the design failures of the scientific process. The program is going to be very educational, as all of them are, but we're really making this one a lot of fun and exciting to be able to get up close with some of the animals, but also see some of the ways that technology succeeded and not succeeded in the past. And we think the stories of the struggles and accomplishments to channel animal behaviors into practical human advances perfectly fits the mission of our exhibits, shows, and experiences. You know, we offer these shows as a chance for an educational experience above and beyond just your everyday walking through the museum. We keep them fresh and new, we change them every couple months, and so there's always something fun and exciting to find here at the Springs Preserve. We have so many classes of every kind here at the Springs Preserve. Why not come and join us so we can all learn to live well in our Mojave Desert home? Well, we do have several things that adults can do at the springs. Right now it's beautiful weather, so we have lots of places for them to be walking around enjoying the beautiful uh, scenery. We've got our botanical gardens, the butterfly habitat is opening up. We've got trails, uh, walk with the dog on the weekend. There are leading uh, positions that come out uh, and take a group of people out to the trails or even in our gardens and learn some of the principles of preventative medicine and also how exercise helps to keep you healthy. You also kind of have the ear of the doctor too, so you get exercise and you learn something at the same time and get healthy. We have our bird walk that's starting again. It'll be the first Wednesday of the month. Our bird walks are led by okay, someone from the it? Red Rock Audubon Society. And we kind of take it a little bit different route each time, depending on where we kind of find the birds. And every time we see at least 10 to 15 different species of birds, and they are so knowledgeable, they can tell us all about birds, their habitats, where they're coming from, if they're here to stay, if it's seasonal, and how you can attract birds into your yard as well so you can have just as much fun as you would here. It's a lot of fun and it's free. And we will have some classes coming up soon. Our drip irrigation classes with the Water Smart Landscaping has been very popular. We do that kind of seasonally so it's still the season for that. How to landscape using less water, zero scape, we've got classes for that. In our botanical garden walks, those happen a couple of times on Saturdays and Sundays, and it's usually led by a master gardener or one of our horticultural uh, team members, and it just depends on who's in the audience, and they just kind of learn what plants are out in our garden, what grows well here, uh, how they could use those things in our landscaping. Part of our mission is to learn how to not only survive in our desert environment, but also thrive. It's remarkable what a difference a few days and degrees can make in transforming your desert vegetable garden from the hard-won harvest of summer crops to the bountiful salad bar our cool season produces.
you can have your salads and your spinach and and your warm season is kind of sort of limited but you can have a better selection of cool season crops. Which reads like a whole grocery list of head and root, leafy and green vegetables and makes it easy to grow what you love and will enjoy come mealtime. Our fall vegetables um, include our broccoli, cauliflower, our cabbages, lettuces, spinach, Swiss chard, you could do all your root crops, which are uh, radishes, red beets, turnips. Uh, we have peas you can grow um, if you have a nice trellis left over from, from your tomato cages. You can grow your peas up on your, on your trellises for your winter months. In fact, such temperate weather will give your garden extra energy to climb and grow and flourish with record speed and endurance. From plant to harvest is a little over three weeks, so you can continue to plant your vegetables during the course of the, of the winter months. The care and placement of your crops can be that much easier by investing in some containers or raised beds and the best possible soil. We want to kind of amend the soil, turn it over, add some more compost, a, a nice balanced fertilizer a complete fertilizer that's got the macronutrients and the micronutrients in it. With a right size garden, you'll have more control over everything that goes into the plants and all the exceptionally fresh flavors of the final products. Well, your own garden is very controlled. You know what goes in the soil. You know there's no pesticides on there. And you're able to select the seed that you want. There's all different varieties of broccolis and cauliflowers and you select one that is going to, you know, be the best tasting for yourself. So the flavor is unbelievably different than what you would get in the supermarket. That should give you good reason to come shopping for garden tips at the Springs Preserve. We have all kinds of classes always. There's always a gardener on staff. We're always in the garden. Feel free to look up one of us and we're, we'll be happy to answer questions and, and kind of lead you in the right direction. And with just a little direction, there's a high likelihood of ending up with the kind of successful vegetable garden that will grow only in our moderate Mojave temperatures. Our sensible herbs class for home educated students will make them hungry to learn about science, technology, engineering, art, and math as we give them a taste for the sensational world of edible plants. Find out more about these three week classes for children ages 6 through 12 by visiting our website at springspreserve.org. There's a lot more to discover, so join us next time here at the Springs Preserve, the premier showplace for the entertainment history, Mojave wildlife, and desert gardening that mingles to bring new life to Las Vegas.